Hey, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for joining us again. I'm Dan Schmidt. This is the Deer Talk Now podcast. This week, we have a very special guest, John Eberhardt, good friend of mine, long time deer and deer hunting contributor for as long as I've been here. John's been contributing in deer and deer hunting and other whitetail specific sources for well over 30 years. He's been killing, I'm not going to make John feel bad here, but he's been killing big bucks almost as long as I've been alive. Not quite. Um, but anyways, John, thanks for joining us. We're really excited to have you on the program today. You sure know how to make a guy feel old. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Dan. I, I have to do that because you look younger than me. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> No, thanks for joining us. I don't. I do you recall when you first started writing for Deer and Deer Hunting? I do not. I think it was. I, I actually don't. Early nineties, early nineteen nineties. Yeah, yeah, probably. Probably. Yeah. Well, if you don't know who John is, I'm just going to tell you right now. Uh, when this podcast is over, get on your search engine, look him up. It's not going to take much to find. I'm just going to give you a couple highlights here because John is one of my idols. Um, he has oh, <laughs> killed over 50 bucks on 32 different properties, all public land or free knock on doors permission. He's never paid a dime to lease. He's never paid a dime for a guided hunt. Correct me if I'm wrong there, John. Oh, um, and correct. he has just killed enormous bucks, lots of public land hunting. I know if, you, if you're into deer hunting, you know he does it out of tree saddles primarily. Um, and he is the real deal. So, John, uh, the first question I have to have for you is, how the heck have you been doing this for such a long time on pressured deer? How have you, I mean, and I know that's a loaded question, but to no, me it seems almost, unbel- it's, this, is like, this is like Aaron Rodgers type stats. The fact that yeah. you've been able to do it, no, no offense to former Matthew Stafford, but I mean, it's like... <laughs> 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 oh, that's good. <laughs> good uh, I, I could go back to some other Lions quarterback, but I can't think of any. But um, how have you been doing it? How do you do that? How have you been so consistent over your life doing this? I hate to sound egotistical, but I work harder than any hunter I've ever known, including my sons. Chris, my oldest boy, Chris, who passed away last January, he worked really hard at hunting. Um, but he he bow hunted in Michigan for quite a few years, and he only had one book that made or one buck that made book and I've got 33, but, uh, which is, I think the most of anybody in Michigan, I just work really, really hard. You know, I, when I'm on public land, I pretend everybody's trying to kill me. That's my thought process. Whereas the only places on this public land that has the proper security cover where a mature buck might move during daylight hours and give me an opportunity. So you have to go, you have to use canoes, you have to use kayaks, you have to cross rivers with waders or hip boots. You have to go beyond the work ethic of all the other hunters because you're competing against them. So by saying, uh, you know, I pretend everybody's trying to kill me, that puts me in the same exact position that mature bucks are because they learn quickly in a state like Michigan with so many hunters that uh, if they move in normal, you know, if they move in a normal way of a subordinate buck or does, they're not going to survive beyond a year and a half, definitely not beyond two and a half. So you have to think that way to get in the mindset of a mature buck in a pressured state. And, you know, and like I've told you on many occasions, when I go out of state to states like Kansas, Iowa, Missouri, Ohio, I drop my guard down big time. I don't hunt there anything like I do Michigan because none of them are as pressured. So Michigan's hands down the toughest state I've ever hunted. That's one thing that we've tried to emphasize. If you haven't seen John's videos on our YouTube page, one thing he said there, the the public and pressured, and that's one tip that I've used from you is that you got to pretend that you're the one to be trying to keep being killed. And that Absolutely. really changes how you look at it. Because one thing, I'm sure you get this asked all the time, you do seminars and workshops and people will say, well, what's one thing you can tell me? Well, there isn't. Like, show me, the, I'm going to show you this property where should I go? Well, it's not that easy, right? I mean, you've, you've got yeah. to, you do an enormous amount of scouting. So let's, let's talk about that for a second. What this time of year before the season, what is your regiment for tackling a new piece of like, let's just say public land or even a small piece of private land. How are you going to tackle it first? 
Uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to probably bring up an aerial, which an aerial is strictly an overview. When you're running pressured areas, you can't look at an aerial like somebody on a TV show does, where all they got to do is find a pinch point or, you know, or a point sticking out into a crop field. You know, they can, they can just look for terrain feature dumps and hunt that because there's no competition and they will kill animals. And in a state like Michigan, places in Wisconsin, PA, you know, up in the Northeast where you've got just tons and tons of hunting pressure, uh, you have to put your feet on the ground. But you still, you know, I look at aerials to find where the bedding areas are, where the nasty security cover is. It's everything I do is based around security cover. Security cover, security cover, security cover. I can't stress that enough. Mature bucks just don't leave security cover or the edge of security cover during daylight hours in heavily pressured areas or they would not be mature bucks, they would be dead. Now, obviously, if a mature buck is with a hot doe, yeah, he may very well go through an open stand of timber with no understory. Uh, but as far as just moving regularly in search of hot does or just normal movements, bedding to feeding, he's either gonna move within security cover or down the edge where he's got a really quick exit strategy. Uh, so everything is based around security cover. And one thing I have noticed, even when I go out of state, I still keep that same thought process in mind because all mature bucks, no matter where they are, they're all, as they age, they get more security cover oriented. You know, I'll see bucks in Kansas or I will walk across a hay field at noon, which is something I'd never see in Michigan. So there are exceptions to what they will do, but still it, all in all, they're still kind of centered around you know security cover movements uh, that's just something that um i think bucks naturally get as they age so how do you do that early season bow hunting in michigan just to give people some kind of idea if you're not from michigan it, it, well i know you you live the whole thing and i mean michigan at one time there was a million deer hunters you know right. if you added up gun hunters and bow hunters michigan was the number one bow hunting state hands down by far that in, still is in the country yeah. um enormous amount of pressure so like you're hunting those pressured bucks rut yeah okay some if, if you got that let's just say pushing towards halloween the first two weeks into november you do your work you're gonna see some deer probably yep. and yep. you and you really work hard but now what about i i know i think michigan's a little bit different than us but i mean in some places, it opens September 1st, September 15th, even October 1st. How are you tackling that during the early season? Because okay, I know you're, you're sticking to security cover, and I know that's a yeah. much harder game than it is during when bucks Every, are actually moving. Michigan's all uh, October 1 opener. You, I think you guys are September 15th, right. maybe some areas yep. September 15th. Uh, but I, what I do is I'll, I'll have maybe 40 to 50 locations ready, that's the you know, half on public, half on – you know, free permission, private. And around September 20th to 25th, I will do what I call a speed tour, uh, where I'm actually going to my early season locations, which are typically food based. They're going to be at oaks or apple trees or, you know, primary scrape areas that were there that I found during postseason the previous spring. Um, and I will actually look to see if the oaks are dropping acorns, if the apple trees are dropping apples, if the scrape areas are active. Um, is there standing corn on the property? I'm a big standing corn guy. Uh, the two, two bucks that I shot last fall, one I rattled out of a standing cornfield on October 3rd. The other one I rattled in within a bedding area in mid-October, which is kind of rare during that October lull. But when I do those speed tours, I'm checking out my basically my early season locations. And obviously, if the trees are dropping acorns or dropping apples or scrapes are, are active, um, you know, on, on the food mass trees, I will look for sign around the trees. Cause obviously if any place where there's a natural food source, those are going to be eating there. And if those are going to be eating there and you know, a lot of those, it's a destination location, there's going to be buck sign in the form of either scrapes, which is rare for early season, but there's definitely going to be rubs because the reason I do that on September 20th or thereafter is most mature bucks are rubbed out by September 5th. So I've got a two to three week window where they're leaving sign at these feeding destination locations. So I will be able to see that sign and I will hunt them according to what kind of buck sign I see during that speed tour. 
And obviously, you know, I'm going to see small rubs. I'm going to see big rubs. So if I don't see rubs that are really high up on the tree designating it's a, from a mature buck because they're taller and their antlers are higher up off their head, uh, I typically won't hunt it. But uh, most of my early season locations are based around food. The food has to have, this is an absolute, absolutely mandatory. It has to have security cover, perimeter security cover around the food source. And it also has to have adequate transition security cover from a known bedding area. So in other words, a buck is not going to get up out of a bedding area and walk through 200 yards of open timber with no understory where he's exposed to go to a feeding destination location, even if the actual feeding destination location has the adequate perimeter security cover around it for him to feel safe eating there. He's not going to make that vulnerable movement during daylight hours. So the feeding destination location, it has to have, it has to butt up the security cover where a deer is going to be bedding, like oak trees on the edge of a bedding area or something, or it's got to have adequate security cover in some sort of a transition route to, from that bedding to feeding location. And also most, most often, it's very rare that I would hunt a, um, you know, a destination feeding location, like a master fruit tree on a morning run, because I'd just be spooking deer with my entry. So how you hunt them strategically in your entry routes and exit routes are also very important. Were you guys p taking notes there? Because in 10 minutes, he just taught you probably, if you've been struggling for years, he just, just visualize what he just said. And the way I extrapolate this from what John says is because I know that you you don't hunt over bait. You don't hunt over food plots. You don't do these things. Not because it's some kind of, and maybe it is for John, but not that it's some kind of ethical thing. It's because the big bucks just don't travel like that. So if you're if you're listening to what John's telling you here as far as top, topography-wise, that's number one. Number, uh, number two, well, there's a couple things I wanted to point on here. 40 to 50 locations. Okay, now we're talking Johnny Eberhardt. That's like, this. that's insane. The fact that you have 40 or 50 op options, mm -hmm. but if you think about that, to me, that's a key to success is options because how many, I know so many people I grew up with, so many people I've hunted with over the years that they say, well, I can't afford to pay, uh, hunt private land. I can't get access, whatever the reasons may be. I'm hunting public land, but they hunt the same spot, even the same stand on September 15th, October 15th, yeah. gun season comes around around Thanksgiving. They're hunting the exact same tree. Yeah. And I think yeah. that is a thing that trips a lot of guys up. And I don't want to yeah. say average guys because there's a ton of guy. I'm an average guy. Every, every guys that just get into that mentality. I'm going to deer camp. I'm hunting my spot. So I think what yeah. you just said there really will change thinking for hunters, especially public land guys. The fact that you have to have not only have to have options, but you've got to think. I always say bird's eye view. You okay? I, the other thing, okay, I'm a lot of things I'm going to talk about here, but no, the other thing is, how long does it take you to figure that out? One one thing I've always said is it's a three year plan for me. Um, well, I'm not going to figure that out very quickly. You might yeah. be able to. Well, I, let me clarify the 40 or 50 locations. I may only hunt 10 or 12 of those, right. maybe 15 max in a season because. Obviously, if, uh, if I've got a location set up at a, a white oak and it's not dropping acorns, I'm not going to hunt there. If it's at an apple tree and there's no apples, I'm not going to hunt there. If it's at a, a primary scrape area and the crop rotations or whatever the food sources are have changed that and that's not an active scrape area that particular year, I'm not going to hunt there. Yet, it may be a primary scrape area in the years that the master of fruit is in that particular zone. So, I may I have a lot of trees. That comes into the work ethic. I work harder than anybody. I hunt 25 to 30 feet. I can prep that many trees because I hunt out of the saddle. I've hunted out of the same saddle since 1981. So I'm not buying multiple tree stands. I can shoot 360 degrees around the tree. You can't do that with tree stands. I, I, there's just so many advantages to saddles. You know, in my personal opinion, and this is an absolute fact for me, uh, two things that have really changed my success rates was in 1981 buying a tree sling which is basically a, a saddle and learning how to properly hunt from it a lot of the saddle guys you see on youtube don't have a clue what they're doing they don't do it properly uh, but learning how to hunt out of a saddle and then in the 
late nineties, I learned how to properly use Sunlock because if you use Sunlock, like most of the TV guys do, or the way they show you in the instructions, it doesn't function properly. So I learned how to take care of Sunlock, how to store it and how to physically use Sunlock. So not having to pay attention to a wind to the wind is also another huge, huge factor. And also you got to look at seasonal and daily timing. You know, I have early season trees. I have mid October trees. I have trees along crop fields that I only know when they're standing corn. So where I'm trying to rattle a deer out of the standing corn, like I did that one last fall. Uh, and then I have rut phase locations, which are typically in bedding areas. You know, I hunt the interiors of bedding areas a lot. I, for the life of me, I can't understand why people don't hunt interiors of bedding areas. If I wanted to kill you, Dan, I'd tie it up in the closet in your bedroom. You're going to be there every night. So that's a small destination location. The smaller the destination location, and as long as it has security cover, which all bedding areas have, the higher your odds are of killing, killing a mature buck. And also, to give you a stat on the bedding area situation, from November 1 through November 14, which is basically the rut phases for Michigan because our gun season opens the 15th of November, I've taken 21 Michigan book bucks, book, book bucks in Michigan. Of those 21, seven were taken between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m., so midday. Middle of the day. So 35% of the bucks I've taken in that 14-day period were midday. Less than 8% of my time spent on stand during those 14 days was during the day. You know, most, most often I'm hunting just morning through evenings. So that's another stat that's a big deal. If you're hunting in the interior of a bedding area or the perimeter edge of a bedding area, your best odds of killing a mature buck there in a pressured state is going to be during the middle of the day. So how do you tell a guy that comes up to you, because I know that this I've seen it happen at, at Deer Expos, Guy comes up to you and says, well, you know, I have this spot. I've got, you know, I've got good food. There is, to me, it seems like good transition cover. How does, how do you tell somebody, how do you pinpoint those? That's where I was getting with my, for me, it's always taken me on a new property. For me, I always say it's it's the third year. I'm like that quarterback that sat on the bench for two years. And then I had to learn, oh, okay, this is where that deer is probably betting. How do you, how do you go about figuring it out? Well, bedding areas are easy to figure out. It's just going to be the densest areas on the property, you know, and then got to keep in mind, I do all of my scouting and all of my location preparation during postseason. So I would never, like in August, go in and scout. You're not going in in summer. You're not going, you're not going in during hunting season. What, what what are you talking about? December, January, February? Your, your best as soon as your season is over and as and if you're in a snow area like if you're in west virginia or virginia or pa or new york uh wisconsin you know you got to wait for the snow to melt because deer deer tend to change their patterns right. as soon as there gets into be any deep snow they, they will leave open timber areas and they'll they'll go you know find places in swamps or something where they're basically out of the wind or cedar swamps so what you see deer activity wise in the snow, if you're scouting, is pretty much irrelevant to fall movement. Right. You may walk through some old, some timber areas where there's absolutely no track for a mile, but yet there's a lot of deer there in the fall. Yeah, you may go in a cedar swamp and it's you can't put your foot down anywhere without stepping on a deer track. Yet they're not there in that quantity in the fall. So, so uh, you know you have to you have to scout those bedding areas during the winter or early spring prior to green up and you go in them, you look for, you know, maybe there's small openings in a pretty dense bedding area. And usually if there is, there's going to be runways through there. There may be some scrape areas on some perimeter bushes or uh, red brush or something in a small opening. And there's definitely going to be some rugs and you basically look for and, and set up or prep your locations, you know, during postseason, And then you never step foot in there until the rut phase, which is to me is going to be November one of deer season and you have to commit to being in your tree not going in but you have to be in your tree an hour and a half before daylight that, that's crazy you, that's one thing you taught you taught me this i don't know if you remember it this would have been <clears throat> gosh the late 90s we were at the madison deer and turkey expo and you told me that hour and a half and i started doing it and my success rate increased 
Now, for me, because when people people say, "Well, you're nuts," but to me, it was getting out of that mentality of like, "Well, I can't shoot an hour and a half before." But the way I described it, which what you described for me is. If I get in there 90 minutes, and now I can't do it anymore with these blood clots, but <laughs> 90 minutes in that tree stand sitting in the dark, yeah. I said, I have a better chance of not busting. Let's say there's a buck. Yeah. If I don't bust him on the way in, well, what if he walks past you, you know, 30 minutes before light? I didn't bust him. I have a chance, and that's happened to me. I've had a chance. I killed that deer later. He came back through at 9, 10 o'clock. Um, yep. maybe he went out and fed a little bit, or he might've just kind of just milled around and then came back through. That was an excellent tip. It's a hard one. The other one, and I don't know if it might've been Gary Clancy that, uh, first taught me this one was <clears throat> staying in the stand in the evening. If you're in a, if you're in a feeding area and for me up North in the, and that was public land in those, what we called Oak mots that, you know, you'd get a Ridge and there's some, just some hot red Oaks in there. I've got deer. I know they're feeding up there a hundred yards in front of me and I'm bow hunting. I'm not coming out. And it was hard. I mean, you know, it gets dark out at five or, you know, whatever. And yeah. I'm sitting in there for an hour and a half and then trying to sneak out of there. But it really was, really was beneficial. Okay. Cu I, a cup, cup, go ahead, I, John, I, have a couple I actually questions bought a loophole uh, <clears throat> thermal imaging unit just for that. Cause when I'm oh, hunting nice. it, oaks or especially at an apple tree which i don't have a lot of apple trees to hunt but i do have some you know after dark i i can actually look around with that and see if there's anything within 40 or 50 yards because many times you know i've gotten out of a tree thinking there's nothing around me because i couldn't hear anything after dark and then then you know sure as heck you spook you spook a deer that's 20 25 yards away and to me you know a lot of people don't put enough emphasis on their exits as they do on their entries exits you know i see these guys wearing these bright led headlamps and they get out they put it on and they're going down the tree the lights shining all over the place yeah uh and they're they're spooking deer with their exits and deer remember that mature deer remember that you know i i typically it's rare i ever turn a light on till i'm at the road unless i i'm walking through a swamp after dark just so i don't and but it's usually a small single covering it with your hand and just light. just so you can see you're not tripping over stuff and yeah things like that that's a that's an excellent point too because i agree with you i think not, not only i think if a deer see, well obviously if a deer now for me this is mostly the the private land hunts that the deer aren't as skittish but if a deer sees you crawl out of that tree forget it that your your law of diminishing returns kicks in immediately Absolutely. um no you walk across that food plot and they see you you walk across yeah. that field and they see you, they're going to remember it. I don't care if it's does and fawns, they're going to remember it. Yep. Um, big bucks, forget about it. I mean, you just ruined that spot, in my opinion. But uh, one thing I wanted to follow up here, because you mentioned yeah. it, because you know me, I like to play devil's advocate. You mentioned Scentlock. Oh, yeah, that's because he's paid off. by. He's just like all these other guys, paid off by Scentlock. That's why he's mentioning Scentlock. I know the story behind you. And just, just let's not even call it Scentlock. Let's call it Activated Carbon. You tell it's my me, preference. I agree. You talk. You tell me. You know, tell me the story. John Eberhardt and activated carbon. Man. All right, let's take a break and let's thank one of our sponsors. Today's episode of Deer Talk Now is brought to you by True Fire and the Edge line of archery releases. Designed with a smaller than dime sized head, the Edge utilizes a linear bearing that delivers an extremely smooth trigger feel. Pull the trigger back to open the jaws and let up on the trigger to close the jaws. This release also features a lockdown set screw for your length of adjustment. Once you have the correct length, just simply tighten the set screw and the length will be locked in place. 100% American made. If you've seen me on Deer and Deer Hunting TV, this is the release that, this is my go-to release. I love these releases. I've been shooting them for years. And what I really especially love about the Edge design is its buckle fold back design. This allows me to put my release on before I leave the truck or right when I leave the truck and keep it on until I come back. Super nice, even for climbing tree stands, does not get in the way. For more information on the Edge release, visit Veridine.com. I do not pay attention to the wind. I researched activated carbon before I actually purchased a Suntlock suit. I am not paid by Suntlock. They do 
not sponsor me uh, to endorse their products. I do it because it works. I just, it took me about three years to physically learn how to properly care for, how to properly store, and how to properly use sunblock. But if you use clean rubber boots or neoprene boots, and you're wearing, you know, uh, reactivated, I don't want to use the term reactivated, but deabsorbed activated <clears throat> carbon sunlock suit. And sunlock owns the patent on using the activated carbon. So that's why I always say sunlock. They own it, basically. So nobody can use it without their permission and paying them royalty. So you've got to wear the pants, you've got to wear the jacket, and you see so many guys on TV that are sponsored by sunlock. They've got to show their face. Yeah. Okay. So if you're showing, if your face is showing and you've got a beard or you're wearing a logo hat like you're wearing right now and you're not wearing a sunblock head cover with a drop down face mask covering your beard, covering your nose, covering your mouth, covering the back of your hair, it's not going to work for you. That's like driving a car with three wheels instead of four. Is it going to help you because you're wearing a jacket covering your upper body and your lower body? Yeah, it's going to help you, but you better pay attention to the wind because if you're in an area that's pressured, where deer are much more attentive to wind direct wind and human odor than they are in non-pressured areas, uh, you're going to get busted. You know, I, I cringe when I see somebody sponsored by Scentlock and they're wearing a stupid logo hat and they've got their face exposed on TV. They got a beard, which beard holds a lot more bacteria because of the hair follicles in your skin. That's this breeding place for bacteria. I even shaved my armpits for God's sake. <laughs> so you know, we don't want a visual, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> everything matters. When you're, when you're using Scentlock, if you're not doing it correctly, it's not going to work. And you can't, you know, you know, a lot of guys, when I'm doing seminars, I'll ask how many people who use Scentlock and not, you know, and not been successful have deer wind of them. And usually over half of the people will raise their hands. They got windy. Okay. I'll say how many, how many of you guys use a backpack? Almost all of them use the backpack. How many of them you guys wash your backpack in some free detergent or you have a sunlock backpack and it's always a zero. So you've got a backpack that you get into with your bare hands hanging there next to you. And then when you get winded, you blame it on your sunlock. It's a total thing. You can't skip one thing and have it work where you pay zero attention. To well, that's you the other it. thing I want to point out for people is look at that video that we did of, of his crazy i would call it crazy total scent approach he's got a minivan he's ripped out the seats he's got all his clothes and tubs Th the biggest thing is what i try to explain to people it's not the fact that you're wearing activated carbon it's not the fact that you washed in scent killer it's not the it, it's all these things put together it's the meticulous minutia yeah. detail that you take like you said the backpack your your wrist release for for I mean how many times you Absolutely. you shoot that in summer you get that thing all sweated up and you never think about it or most guys don't think about it they're not just thinking about oh is that holding on to scent it's all those little things and those are some of the things that you do you know, even washing my saddle you know I wash my saddle a couple of times during the course of the year but when I'm handling it it's in a scent free tote in a carbon line bag so when I'm handling it I got my sunlock gloves on. And it's also worn on the exterior of my sunlock suit. So it's not getting any odor on it. So, But I still wash it a couple of times during the course of the season. So let's go back to the, the tree saddle. 1981. Yes. Who was making saddles in 1981? Uh, it was called the Anderson Tree Sling. And uh, I went I went in the local sporting store. Was it for hunting? Store. Yeah. Was it for hunting? Okay. It was. Yep. Okay. Uh, and basically my Eberhardt signature saddle is a very close replica of what I bought. I'll be dang. Because nobody was, was just, using it. Nobody I'm, I'm was sorry. using that. Nobody was using those in 1981. Nobody. I didn't see. I I don't think I met anybody that was using a saddle for at least 10 or 15 years other than myself and my boys. Because I bought them one once I learned how to use it. And it took me a while to learn how to use it. But when I was looking at the packaging, here's this stick figure guy on a tree. You know, just like you'd see a consumer power guy on a telephone pole tethered to the tree on roll. And I was like, well, that's interesting because he, he it showed him walking around the tree, how small it was. Basically, it was the size of a softball rolled up that I could keep in my backpack. So it wasn't cumbersome because when you're walking into public land, you know, in a pressured area, you're in the junk and you can't be carrying tree stands and sticks to get 
hung up on all, everything because you'll just be cussing and swearing and you'll be sweating your butt off by the time you get there. So this is something that's small, very versatile. I uh, can hunt every tree I've hunted since 1981. I've hunted with that single saddle. So, uh, you know, it's just got so many advantages over a tree stand. If I had to hunt out of a tree stand again, I'd probably quit bow hunting. And I know you it's don't hunt on, on a stand. So let me, before I give up 1981, because yeah. I know you well enough, I want to make you feel even older. Yes. April 1981, English class, St. Hubert's Elementary School in Hubertus, Wisconsin. <laughs> the English teacher asked her students what they wanted to be when they grow up, and they, she had, they had to write a theme paper. And one of the students, an apple cheek boy who had full strawberry blonde hair at the time, said he wanted to become the editor of Deer and Deer Honey. True story. True story. No way. True story. Wow. <laughs> April 1981. There, there you go. There you have it. Okay, so what? Uh, wow. that being said, we all know you're very fit. You can do this. Guys that aren't that way, um, what would you say, what's the biggest thing in your mind that holds guys and girls back from consistently tagging deer? We're going to talk about bow hunting because I know that's, you, you don't gun hunt, I know that. So yeah. for bow hunting, what what is what are some of the biggest things that people are doing wrong over and over and over again? Just simply deer hunting. Not necessarily uh, killing record class bucks, just just maybe filling a tag. I think most people are overly lazy, um, and they're not willing to put the work in. Um, you know, I work out every night. I'm 71 years old. I can still climb with anybody, um, and they're not security cover oriented. I, you know, I've got a YouTube channel, and on s several of my YouTube shows, you know, I'm walking through public land, and there will be you know, 10 or 15 tree stands still left in trees in February where most people have already taken them out, but they're all in open timber with no understory. They're in, you know, next to oaks or whatever. And then you get, you walk far enough and there's going to be an edge someplace butting up to a bedding area and you never see any hunting stands along or within those bedding areas. They're always out in the open area. I think people just like to see deer. You know, if you just like to see deer, that's fine. You know, everybody's got different goals. Uh, my goal is to kill mature bucks in hard to kill areas. Uh, you know, I, I get very disappointed in what's happened over the last 25 years, you know, because now we're somewhat turning into a European style hunting where only the affluent get the hunt. You know, everybody can, anybody, if they got enough money, can buy property, put in food plots, uh, land management, and nobody else, no competition. And, uh, you know, kill big bucks just because there's going to be a lot of them and they have no competition. So they will get their opportunities no matter how bad of a hunter they are. But uh, to me, it's all about work ethic, uh, security cover, security cover, security cover. That's one thing I always try to stress. No matter where you hunt, if you prep and prep all your locations, thinking about security cover and daytime movements, you know, would you walk through here during the daytime if people were trying to kill you? No, you probably wouldn't. So you want to be in an area where a mature buck may feel comfortable moving during daylight hours. You know, you can see all the sign in the world, scrapes and 30 rubs around an area. If it's not conducive for day daytime activity by a mature buck, you're not going to see a mature buck there. You may see some subordinate bucks there, but you're not going to see the buck you're trying to kill. So don't just think about all the sign you see. The location has to be suitable for a daytime activity by a mature buck. Work ethic is everything to me. You get out of it what you put into it. So, you know, that's why I have 40 or 50 trees every year. I always lose property. I've probably lost 50 hunting properties over the year because, you know, on my private properties, it's all knock on doors and they let anybody out there. So, right. and then there's been several times I've killed a big buck and as soon as the owner found <laughs> out, then his kids or his son-in-law wants to hunt the property. And that's the end then, of that. And then I'm, yeah. of course, out. <laughs> that's the end of so You know I've, how that goes. <laughs> I've experienced that. I experienced that in spades. Yeah. Um, this is a chummed question here. Do today's hunters live under a false perception of what's reality? Oh, deer? without a doubt. Absolutely. I I have talked to kids in stores. I do a lot of in-store stuff because I'm a sales rep in the and, you know, I've talked to kids that were like 20 years old and they hadn't killed a buck yet because they're waiting to kill a pulpy young buck. And, in, and they, 
I know guys that have hunted 40 years in Michigan and a good, decent ball hunters, they've never killed a hundred inch buck. So, you know, you have to base reality on where you're hunting. Right. You're not going to kill something if it doesn't exist. That's an impossible task. So, you know, like when I go out to Kansas, my criteria is 150 inch. When I'm in Michigan, depending on whether I'm in northern Michigan or southern Michigan, because northern Michigan is sand based and there's, you know, there's no minerals. I've shot five year, five and a half year old bucks in northern Michigan that had 105 inch rack. You know, I've shot three year olds in southern Michigan that had 100 mid 150s. So you have to base your goals on where you're hunting at that particular moment. Um, I don't know if that answered the question. Well, that answers <laughs> that answers the question, which leads to the next question. I have my own thoughts, and it might be different than yours, but what do you think about the whole, because to me, what I've seen in the 30 years I've been doing this is there's been a shift from, it used to be record books. Yep. You know, I'm going to shoot a buck that's going to get in the record books. If it's going to be in the Pope and Young book or the Boone and Crockett book or the, you know, Michigan commemorative bucks, commemorative bucks in Michigan or Wisconsin buck and bear, whatever it happens to be, Northeast Big Buck Club. I've seen a shift from that to, oh, no, well, now we're aging, dear, you know. And, um, <laughs> yeah. okay, I've said that sarcastically because you know how I think about it. What are your thoughts on where, where as hunters, it's kind of gone from, does anybody care about the record books anymore? And are we too hung up on trying to age deer on the hoof? Well, that's something that I've never really done. I've never hunted for a particular age class. I'm, pretty, I'm more antler-based. You know, I'm hunting antlers, uh, but yeah, I, I think in the media, I think it's more, you know, people are more focused on age class or trying to kill an older age class deer. I think if you're hunting managed property, I think that's a, can be a good plan. Cause if you are hunting managed property and there's a five and a half year old buck, but yet he has inferior antlers, that's a buck you don't want in your gene pool. So, you know, you're, you're trying to have big antler bucks as well as having, you know, a nice older age, age class of animals on your property. So uh, to, to me personally, I never think about age class. You know, when I see a big animal coming in and he's got, you know, if he only has 125 inch set of antlers and I'm out in Kansas and I'm after a 150 and he may be a three or four year old, I'm probably not going to shoot him until it's the last day of the season. But, uh, there's just a lot of things that are different now than what it used to be. You know, it used to be extremely difficult to kill a hundred inch buck in Michigan. I mean, it was very, very difficult. There's just so many people passing on year and a half and two and a half year old bucks. Now there's a lot of them around, or I should say a lot more of them a lot around more. everywhere, even in Michigan, even on public land in Michigan. Shoot, if you've shot a hundred inch buck on public land in Michigan in the seventies or eighties, you probably giant, won the yeah. county buck. Um, nowadays, you know, when I'm going around and doing in-stores, I used to see, uh, you know, 30 years ago, 110 inch buck would be the biggest buck I'd see on the wall of all the pictures of the customers. Now I don't even see one under, you know, under 110, they're right. all 110 to 150. So just that's, times that's have changed. private land areas though. Yeah. Those are all private land. Yeah. Those because usually are... when you're in a store, when I'm in a store doing a sales call, you know, they've got all their customers, which most of them are on private land. But, uh, I mean, just the, the pictures you see and the bucks you see are much, much bigger now than they were 20, 30 years ago. And I'm sure you can Absolutely. agree with that. Well, I don't want to cut this short, but I'm going to have to. Uh, we're going to have John on for more podcasts in the future. John, I want to thank you for joining us. I know it's abbreviated, but I promised everyone we're not going to go on for three hours for these podcasts because I personally can't sit there and listen to somebody for five, <laughs> three hours. Um, no offense to you or anybody else. C tell everybody where they can find out more about you and some of the, uh, I know you, do you still do your workshops? I still do. They're all full for this year though. So they're, they're booked on. Uh, I do have a YouTube channel. It's called Hebrew Heart Outdoors. Um, and everything on it's real. I don't, no fluff. I'm not sponsored by anybody. I don't endorse anything for money. I would never, ever do that. Um, so it's Hebrew Heart Outdoors. I do have a website. I sell, I've written three fall hunting books and uh, produce some instructional DVDs and the website is D E E R hyphen J O H N dot net. If anybody's interested, but all you got to do is Google my name. and a bunch of You're going to find it. We'll put it here in the comments too. John, thanks a lot for joining us and we'll see you all next time 
on the Deer Talk Now podcast. Thanks, Dan. The Deer Talk Now podcast is brought to you by Cuddy Link Cell Cameras. Up to 24 cameras, one cell plan, and as low as $10 per month. 10 point crossbows, the fastest crossbows in the world. Wildlife Research Center's Scent Killer Gold. Apply it, dry it, and go hunt. Full range hanging systems, the best way to display your shoulder mount trophies. Hunt Stand, the number one hunting and land management app. And Traditions Firearms, feel the difference.